Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Welcome to this uh, breakout session where we're going to be focusing on young Europeans and their employment and social challenges. And many of them uh, are facing a lot of very difficult challenging in the current times, post-pandemic, of course, but also due to the current economic crisis, um, inflation and... Uh, many other factors that play into their lives. We will have three sessions uh, throughout this particular breakout where we will be focusing on the findings of the report uh, from the Commission on employment and social developments in Europe. 2022 is still for a few weeks the year of youth, which of course makes this breakout session all the more relevant uh, for our work. The first session will be more general, we'll look more at the prospects uh, that face young Europeans in this, uh, as I said, post-pandemic world, uh, which uh, both heavily impact their opportunities and their well-being. And together with social partners who are sitting here with us uh, now, we will look at the best practices and we'll also try to highlight the uh, most effective measures that have been taken so far. Sessions two and three later on will uh, help us dig a little more in, in depth into the effects of the COVID pandemic on the labor market. We'll also be talking about learning losses due to school closures, and we will discuss the diversity in young people's living conditions with our other expert panelists. We will, be, we will be consulting with you throughout the three sessions, so with you here in the room, but with you online as well. Um, and we will be asking you your contributions, your opinions about quite a few topics that we're going to be discussing. Let's start right now with our first Slido question. To join the Slido, Slido discussion, I think you know the hashtag by now, it's hashtag EU Social Forum ESDE, ESDE for short. So EU Social Forum, ESDE, it's on your screen. First question, what in your view is the main challenge that faces young people's work prospects and well-being in the post-pandemic world? Open, open question, one word, maybe a combination of two words, but not more than that. I let you work on it, think about it, and we'll come back to the results of the Slido in a few minutes after our first presentation. But to help us set the scene this morning and present the overall findings of the report that I mentioned, um, I'm going to give the floor to Barbara Kaufmann, who's the Director for Employment and Social Governance at the European Commission. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning, Florence. And welcome. So over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm really happy to um, uh, be with you uh, though uh, virtually. Yesterday I was still in uh, Brussels uh, in the auditorium, but today I'm in Dublin. Uh, but thanks uh, for letting me present our ESTA report, uh, which, as you said, uh, focuses on young Europeans and employment social challenges. I uh, think that uh, it's not the first time that we uh, talk about young people. Five years ago, we had a report on intergenerational fairness. And as you said, now we have the um, uh, European Year of Youth, but we also feel that there are so many challenges facing the young people that it's really uh, time again to have, have a closer look. So what I will do is I'll walk you a bit uh, through the report, starting with the main employment and social developments. So we have seen the impact of COVID and also look at more structural issues. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And, uh, and uh, for instance, transitions from education to the labor market. I don't know whether somebody is yeah, uh, passing on the next slide. So, and then uh, also look at uh, social dialogue and some key initiatives, but very briefly. So let's uh, start with the uh, employment uh, situation in the next slide. Uh, basically, I think it was clear that we had this 
uh, huge uh, contraction of output, 6%, and at the same time, some employment uh, reduction due to COVID. And after that, we had a, a great rebound, which you see when the green uh, line was shooting up uh, and employment also recovering. So far, so good. But then when we go to the next slide, we see what happened. We have the inflation that has shot up due to Russia's war against Ukraine and all the resulting energy crisis. And what we are now expecting, we can already see uh, that European businesses and citizens, you know, are already feeling what, 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 was, what is coming to the economy. And we uh, last week, the Commission um, uh, published the autumn forecast where you see that GDP is moderating in 22. It is uh, broadly stagnating in 23 and then only slightly rebounding. And at the same time, we can see that the labor market is still resilient but uh, also in 23, uh, we don't expect employment uh, uh, growing anymore, and, and, and uh, only then in 24, a slight pickup. So that's just the kind of background that we have. There's nothing yet on, on the youth, but obviously youth has been uh, particularly affected also in this context. Now let's go to the next slide. And here, uh, just to say, when we looked at unemployment rates, of course, due, uh, due to the uh, recovery, also unemployment has come down. Uh, and uh, uh, here you don't see actually the developments, but you see uh, actually a comparison in 2021. So in 2021, uh, what, what we can see is that um, unemployment has, of course, uh, uh, come down, but what is the most striking here on the right side, you see the averages, is that uh, the youth unemployment is roughly double, both in the EU on average and in the Euro area. And when you look at uh, different member states, you also see that there are huge differences in terms of uh, where member states stand. Uh, we have, of course, some member states uh, like Greece, uh, Spain, Italy, that show really strikingly high numbers. And it's therefore clear that there is really uh, the need for uh, continuous and strong action. This is also the background, of course, why there is a youth uh, 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 guarantee, a reinforced youth guarantee. Now, that, let's look then at the social outcomes. And here, uh, basically, uh, what we can say is that uh, the uh, risk of poverty and social exclusion increased half a percentage point in, in 2022 to COVID. It could, of course, be much more uh, if there had not been defective measures such as uh, short-time uh, employment schemes. And uh, uh, yet one has to say that some population groups were much more affected, uh, people with temporary jobs, uh, people with a uh, migrant background and young. And as far as the young are concerned, uh, this is the blue line. Um, uh, here, the risk of poverty rate increased uh, more. So more people came into risk of poverty and social exclusion by one percentage point. And when you look at the right slide, you see what happened. The share of benefits uh, in, in pre-tax income has really increased substantially. In other words, uh, what we see on the left side could have been much worse. Poverty could have increased much more, but thanks to the uh, measures that were taken, uh, at least uh, this was contained. Uh, now, of course, we are at a moment where we see this major uh, impact on purchasing power and possibly in the future also on employment, that could be another huge risk factor. But for that, we don't have the data apart from maybe some, some uh, first calculations that you can see, for instance, in our October Esther quarterly review, which shows that uh, severe material and social deprivation uh, uh, could pick up quite substantially if we don't have uh, the necessary measures to support. So uh, then um, uh, let's look for a moment at education. And there in the next slide, you will not get actually the impact, but I just wanted to show you that slide because it shows how um, the closure uh, uh, and the red would be the total closure um, of uh, uh, schooling 
uh, has uh, affected people's life. And uh, obviously, if uh, we uh, look uh, then more closely into, um, I mean, the, the green is just when you have uh, the normal closure of the university and, and, and schooling, but basically what we uh, have to expect from that, that there has been some important learning loss and there's some first evidence we don't have that across all countries uh, in terms of how uh, learning lo loss is likely to also have a negative impact uh, on, on, on uh, young people's life and, uh, and, 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 and of course earning, uh, though I have to say uh, when mitigating measures have been taken, for instance, additional targeted teaching for most adversely affected students, then this has of course had a positive effect. All right, uh, then I would say let's move on and uh, basically uh, look for a moment at a number of uh, uh, ideas uh, that we have collected from where uh, young people are standing in life. Uh, and therefore, let's look at the next slide, please. And uh, here you can see some key concerns of people, young people, when it comes to financial security in old age, when it comes to adequate housing, when it comes to uh, future career prospects. I would actually say that is relatively uh, uh, low compared to what I would have expected, uh, but maybe also show a certain uh, flexibility and readiness to move from one job to the other, but then also other uh, concerns uh, being it about uh, uh, preserving peace in the current context of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, or uh, in terms of green transition, where you see a strong uh, fear on the one hand of what is coming from climate change, on the other hand, a, a commitment to green transition. And I would say, interestingly, also they are saying that more than half think they have the right skill, which also means that there are others that uh, could still uh, uh, require new skills. So let's come then to uh, the next point. And uh, here, I think uh, the question is now uh, that we know that, of course, uh, there are uh, young people have to uh, uh, look at different parts of their life, their key transitions to adulthood, they're finishing studies, they're entering the labor market, they're leaving parental home, and all this is changing dynamics. What is interesting in this slide is basically that nowadays, the younger generation, um, they enter the labor market almost two years earlier, uh, later than uh, than the older generation, and also they leave uh, education later. Um, so uh, I think, of course, that also uh, could influence when they start uh, having an income. And uh, uh, let's go to the next slide then. And here uh, you see what is happening in terms of the impact on uh, um, being uh, neither in education, no employment, nor uh, training. And uh, here I think it's interesting to see that basically, first of all, it's worrying to see, and uh, the Commissioner Schmidt mentioned it yesterday too, uh, we have 13 people, 13% uh, of young people in, in such a situation. Uh, and uh, the, the chart shows the probability of becoming a need. And uh, basically, I think what can be seen here quite strikingly is that when you have a uh, uh, a tertiary or secondary education, then uh, you uh, have a much uh, lower chance of being in need. Uh, that can be further, um, once you control for the parental background, actually, uh, this effect is a little bit less uh, uh, strong because then the parents parental background comes in, but it's still very strong. I find it also interesting that basically when uh, when you control for the educational uh, achievement, then uh, 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 women also face a higher chance of being needed once you control for that educational achievement, which often is higher. Um, I, uh, on the right side, you can actually see that uh, generally in southern member states, um, the parental background uh, plays a bigger role. And of course, that's an issue for social mobility. 
Now, let's go to the next slide. And here, I think what is also very interesting uh, uh, in the report, uh, we looked at uh, how young people are faring in crises and uh, used the uh, actual data, uh, but then uh, compared how are they actually doing uh, in, a, in, in a longer uh, or in a shorter crisis. And basically, uh, the left uh, uh, graph shows you that uh, um, with the mild and long uh, recessions, there are quite some differences. And uh, basically, um, the uh, if I may explain this for a moment, the blue line shows how young people are doing differently from the um, from the average. And you see when the crisis is mild but long, uh, they are doing much worse in terms of employment impact, while when the crisis is deep uh, uh, but short, uh, their employment prospects recover much more quickly and can even be better. Uh, and I think, uh, of course, today we would have said, aha, okay, we had a short crisis, uh, COVID uh, resembled uh, to a short and deep recession, and that uh, would have been okay, um, at least in terms of prospects, Coming, becoming much uh, more quickly better. Uh, now, of course, we are in this situation where we are expecting a, a further slowdown and uh, things get uh, much more, more uncertain. Um, let's then go uh, to the next slide. And here, uh, what uh, is clear also that, of course, uh, uh, young people are facing a lot of uh, uncertainty uh, in terms of incomes due to precarious contracts, higher income uh, 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 volatility. And basically here, uh, the point uh, I wanted to make is that um, home ownership rates among young people uh, in the light of increasing house prices and, and tighter mortgage conditions um, are really uh, um, becoming uh, a, a, a factor that uh, campus uh, young people from, from having their own home. And uh, here you can see, of course, how uh, their income uh, that has to be mobilized to have a home is much higher than that of the average population and uh, therefore making living conditions more difficult. It's just one feature, of course, of many other different uh, living conditions. I don't have so much time to go into the solutions. I wanted to say, of course, one important aspect, let's go to the next slide, is that uh, uh, social partners can play a key role also in organizing uh, uh, support for young people, trainings, uh, dedicated campaigns, uh, uh, strategies and tools uh, for skills also are very important, especially now also in the context of the green and the digital transition. Uh, uh, what we uh, uh, see, though, is that, for instance, when we look more closely at trade union membership, that uh, uh, in almost 23 members, in, in, 20, in 23 member states, uh, the share of workers who are members of a trade union is lower for young people um, and uh, here, uh, basically, uh, I think uh, there could be st still some, some improvement over the next years, and I think uh, there uh, could be also a possibility for um, social partners us to uh, try to embrace uh, more, let's say, the young generation and, uh, and uh, also help, uh, therefore, uh, prepare for the, for the uh, uh, new economy. Now, um, uh, there are also quite a few measures. We can go to the next slide for a moment. And uh, I think uh, my presentation is not really... Uh, um, well, one slide back, please. Uh, I will not have the time to go through them, but I think when you listen to the uh, speeches, for instance, of the president and others yesterday, you know that a lot is uh, being undertaken to support um, 
the young people through EU programs to member states uh, initiatives. Uh, just a few are mentioned here, reinforced youth guarantee, European skills agenda, ALMA, for instance, uh, and of course, there are also many funding programs. I think all these uh, play an important role, but I think uh, uh, this report, and I'm sure also this discussion now, will show how much there's still to be done to uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the young people really have a, a better future. I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Barbara. <laughs> and, and thank you for joining us from Dublin. Um, we will, Maybe of course, I... of course, please. I'm afraid. I'm afraid the line has been cut off, so we did not hear Barbara's last comment. So uh, before we comment on the key results of this report uh, with our speakers in a minute, let's look at the results of our Slido poll. So cost of living, housing, mental health are definitely the three uh, outstanding challenges that uh, you have all uh, highlighted. Um, and I'm sure we will come back to some of them in uh, the future discussions. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to welcome our speakers to continue this discussion. So it's a pleasure to have with us this morning Romina Boarini, who's the director of WISE, and WISE is the Center on Wellbeing, Inclusion, Sustainability, and Equal Opportunity at the OECD. We have with us as well Tia Yat, who's president of the Youth Committee of ETUC, that's the European Trade Union Council, and Maxime Ceruti, who's the director of social affairs at Business Europe. Our fourth expert is joining us online from Paris. We have with us Pierre Cahuc, who is a professor at Sciences Po. Good morning. Um, Pierre, I will actually start with you uh, with uh, my first question, because this year's report that we have just heard about um, shows that mid and long recession will impact young people more severely uh, than a short and, and sharp recession. So in the current context where uncertainty really prevails, um, what do you think are the prospects of young people in the labor market if we look at the midterm? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to participate in this forum. I'm very sorry that I cannot be with you in person. Uh, I'd like to start to, to congratulate the, the, the European Commission for the very, very interesting and excellent report on the situation of, of young people in the labor market in, in European countries. So I think the report is really very informative. And uh, from my point of view, it, it highlights concerning the labor market, the situation of young people in the labor market, three important facts. First, young people are always in a more difficult situation than adults. Their employment rate is from two to four times higher than that of adults, depending on the country. Second point, the situation of young people is very, very diverse. It's especially problematic for those who are low skilled and uh, even so much more in countries where unemployment is high, especially in the Southern European countries. And third point, young people who are at the start of their professional career by definition are much more affected by large economic downturns than adults. And from this point of view, unfortunately, I think that the prospect for many young people for the months and years to come are probably quite bleak. So the problem is that the economic slowdown that is caused by the current monetary policy and the war in Ukraine uh, as Barbara has stressed, is likely to materialize in the coming months. The slowdown is likely to last also because the average duration of transmission of monetary policies and economic activity is about one year. And once there has been a decline in GDP, in GDP growth, this impact on employment is about uh, six months of lag. So the prospect from that point of view is not very, very good. And moreover, uh, we can expect wages to catch up with inflation, and this will slow down hiring and be particularly unfavorable to young people who are entering into the labor market. And we are also to point out the fact that young and underperforming firms, which have 
the most difficulty to, to cope with wage adjustments are the ones which are the most affected by in, in these circumstances. And so we know that these firms more frequently employ young people. And uh, so this implies that this period of wage catch up would be particularly unfavorable to young people. Obviously, in this context, active employment policies in favor of young people can play a role. But unfortunately, it's well known that they have very limited effectiveness on youth unemployment and also on youth poverty rate, even if they do have to play a role. And moreover, we also know that the financial situation of many European countries limits possibility of using demand policies to support activities. So therefore, in this context, I think that the situation of young people in the labor market is likely to deteriorate considerably in the middle term, especially if labor market institutions, institutions do not evolve to, to facilitate job creation, particularly in countries where unemployment rate is, is high. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, thank you very much, Pierre. And, um, I'm, I'm going to turn now to our um, other speakers and, and feel free, of course, if you would like to comment on the uh, results of the Slido that we've had, cost of living, housing and mental health being the main challenges. Um, so, Romina, I'm going to start with you. Um, we, we've heard in the report that indeed the, um, the COVID pandemic has dispro disproportionately hit young people above all, and, and, and Pierre was referring to it as well. Um, their labor market was badly hit, and uh, they've, been, they've been facing very important learning losses due to school closures. So res recent research um, carried out by the OECD uh, focused on a broader range of impacts as well. You've been looking into health, social connections, um, and safety as well. So how are young people recovering, or are they recovering? Well, thank you so much, uh, Florence, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I also want to join uh, uh, Pierre in actually congratulating the uh, Commission for you know, organizing this very important uh, workshop and for an excellent report that is very, very relevant for all the topics we're also working on at the OECD. Uh, I was very, very interested to see that, uh, you know, the results of the poll uh, we were pointing to cost of living, housing and mental health. Uh, these are also, I think, key points or priorities for the work we have done and we are doing in the OECD. And I'm going to, in particular, talk about mental health. Before I do that, let me just remind that, indeed, the pandemic has been a, a well-being pandemic. It's not just... In, uh, a, a sort of something that has essentially challenged and jeopardized the living uh, conditions of many, many people uh, and youth in particular, but actually this is something that actually has had tremendous impacts on the way people were living and youth were living. So if you look at things such as social connectedness, social connections, these are obviously primary factors of importance for young people. Those have been heavily disrupted. Uh, during the pandemic, throughout the two years of the pandemic, in fact, the feelings of loneliness have steadily increased among the young population. And approximately one uh, in three young uh, individuals actually declared to be in a situation of loneliness. Uh, also, life satisfaction, uh, measures of subjective well-being, the experience of life as a whole has actually decreased. And it's the first time, really, in OECD countries since ever that we see such a strong uh, negative impact on the sentiment of lives. So uh, how uh, is the situation right now? And I think it was interesting to see, you know, so the report that Barbara just presented was giving us the picture uh, until very, very recently. And also uh, Pierre was telling about obviously what that means in terms of the labor market prospects. I want to share key points here. First of all, uh, still on the economic well-being, I'll speak one uh, really, really fast point and then I'll, I want to cover the other aspects. But on the labor markets, we do agree that of course, the hit has been very severe. At the moment, however, I want to say that there is a little bit of recovery. If you look at the employment rates uh, of the very young people in the OECD, uh, now they have reached the pre-pandemic level. So this is a positive new news. Of course, uh, this was, you know, I'm talking about early 2022. So that was before uh, the war. That was before the surge of inflation, and I think you know what the other speakers have commented upon in terms of you know the macroeconomic turning cycle is clearly going to have an impact. And so you know it's a positive news, but we are worried that it's not going to stay very positive for a long time. Cost of living. This is the first time that the young generation see inflation at that high level. 
If you see in OECD countries, we haven't seen uh, you know, those high, uh, re uh, record high levels of inflation since 40 years, in some countries even longer. It means the young people are experiencing this for the first time. And of course, they're very worried. This was very clear, I think, in the slides that we saw, but also in the poll, of course. Why they are so worried? Not is just because they don't know it, but also because their budget massively depends on things such as energy, transport, and housing, indeed. And all those items, obviously, are you know, very, very um, uh, problematic when it comes to the inflation. The inflation surge in all OECD countries, without no exception, is driven especially by sort of the hike of energy. And so this is really, so overall, the youth spend 50% of the budget on these three items combined, uh, transport, energy, and and renting. So you see, obviously, they have very good reasons to be worried about it. When it comes to mental health, uh, in all OECD countries, we saw that uh, the symptoms of anxiety and depression have increased, and even more so for the young generation. So uh, in uh, the OECD, youth were uh, or had uh, sort of more uh, likelihood, were more likely to actually express those symptoms of, report, uh, of anxiety and, and depression. 30% to 80% more likely. This was during the pandemic, but m more recently in 2022, countries have also you know, launched new surveys and the situation is still not great. In France, for instance, uh, in 2022, 42% of the young people were reporting symptoms of mental health distress as opposed to 23% in the overall uh, population. Similar in the, U uh, in the United States, almost half of the young uh, people were actually saying that they have uh, big problems in terms of mental health. I also wanted to comment about uh, the civic engagement and you know, the youth voice uh, in the civic and political life. That's another area where I think we are very, very worried at the OECD because uh, already uh, after the great financial recession, we saw that actually a lot of uh, young people uh, lost confidence in the government. So if you look at trust in governments and institutions, in formal institutions, this has declined and has steadily declined actually among the young people in all OECD countries. And we ran a very recent survey on this uh, just uh, last year, actually we published the results during the summer, and we still see that you know, among the all uh, age groups in uh, the OECD, the youth are the ones that have the lowest level of trust in governments. So only one in three individuals uh, is uh, actually entrusting governments, which I think is quite telling, obviously, uh, you know, concerning factors. Of course, it doesn't mean that uh, youth are not active. It doesn't mean that they're not resilient. They are. Uh, I think we all heard yesterday uh, from the discussions in this forum how important an instrument they have been to push forward and to actually mobilize themselves to ask for climate change, for commitments, etc. So clearly, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, generation of young activists is trying uh, to uh, change things and actually shaping, I think, the policy debate in a very, very important manner. But at the same time, I think it's also fair to say that they're still uh, feeling that they're not enough integrated in the society, definitely from a social and political perspective. Thank you. Indeed, so the recovery uh, when it happens is going to be a pretty long process. And you have talked about uh, some of the measures that have been put in place. And uh, Tia, I'm, I'm turning to you. I mean, there have indeed been a number of policy measures uh, at government levels in, in, in most uh, EU countries, but um, social partners have also been playing a very important role because uh, they have been supporting companies and, and, and workers, young workers, of course, in the process of recovery. And if we look both at um, the EU and the national level, there have been several campaigns and initiatives, strategies put in place uh, to support the integration of young people into the labor market. Uh, but which of those practices have really proven effective and uh, efficient in integrating them? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me as well. Um, so yeah, when talking about young people, I think we have to look at the labor market very holistically and also from the past. So what we, as the trade unions, have been warning is that we have to learn from previous crises, so from previous economic and financial crises that actually left the labor market a very hostile place for young people because of austerity measures, because of flexibilization of labor market. Uh, we actually saw that young people are prevailing in non-standard forms of employment 
deployment um, in zero hour, hour contracts, platform work, of course, unpaid internship or low paid internships. And basically, this was the reason when the pandemic hit, they were the first one who were laid off, who were without any safety net, without any safety, um, so, yeah, safety protection, social coverage. And this is why the consequences of the COVID hit young people the hardest. And now talking about the recovery, we were looking very much um, about the shore measures, about uh, recovery and resilient funds. And unfortunately, what we saw is, again, that young people are being left behind. That there were very little countries who have actually developed tailor-made measures addressing specific situation of young people. So, for example, specific measures that would help students. Uh, financially as well, specific measures that would help apprentices, that would help um, interns, that would help platform workers, all of those who are in non-standard forms of employment. Um, there were some of the countries, and what we learned is that exactly those countries that develop different support, different mechanisms, um, different tailor-made measures for addressing all of those different uh, categories of workers at the end of the day, they were dealing with the crisis more successfully. And we saw um, in some of the countries those examples, but not in many. And yes, of course, talking about young people and representation in trade unions, we also realized that trade unions weren't so much involved in those process, in developing the national response to the crisis. Um, and of course, this is why I would say that yeah, young people are, uh, are not well represented in the trade unions, they are not well represented at the labor market, and neither are the decision-making processes. Um, and maybe I yeah, just to refer also to the mental health. There are more and more researchers um, comparing the consequences of precarity on mental health. And they are comparing the consequences of precarity, and um, those non-standard forms of employment, in comparison to the long-term unemployment. And what they realize is that the consequences of precarity are higher than the long-term unemployment. Because young people who are long-term unemployed, of course, it means that they have been without a job for one year or even longer, but they manage to cope with this. They develop some kind of mechanisms to face the situation and deal with it. While the ones who are changing jobs, who are in short-term contracts, uh, um, they are uh, every time hoping and being disappointed. So it's basically this instability that it's jeopardizing not only the mental health of young people, but of course the prospects of young people and the whole labor market as such. Thank you. Maxime, I have the same question for you, really. What, what were the most effective, the most efficient measures that were put in place in order to integrate young people into the labor market? Thank you very much. And um, it's a pleasure to be here today and have the opportunity to, to interact with the other speakers and, and also, uh, of course, to have uh, the view of the European Commission on, on the latest developments on our labor markets. And this report is indeed providing um, a useful um, analytical base for what we are discussing here. Um, but um, I want to start with a message to the young people because uh, we are speaking about youth employment. And the message to the young people is that we are living in societies that are aging. These societies that are aging means that we expect in the coming decades that a significant part of our labor markets is going to be absent because many people are going to retire. It's more than 20 million people that are expected to retire in the coming two decades. Um, we have a total labor market of 200 million people in Europe, around 200 million people. This means 10%. And we do not have enough people coming into the labor market as young people to compensate for the loss of all those who are aging and who are becoming retired. So the, the key point is that we need all the young people. We need all the young people for our societies to create prosperity and to grow. And starting from that very basic and important um, uh, observation of, of reality on our societies and labor markets, I think the situation remains hopeful for the young people. And that is very important to say it, because there is a lot of needs on our labor markets that are currently not met. We have important labor and skill shortages and even though we expect indeed that um, the current energy crisis is going to lead to more unemployment, 
we also have the clear view that um, we will have uh, a situation where we will have remaining labor and skill shortages in parallel. So um, we will need to work on both fronts at the same time. And that means for labor and skill shortages, it's very important that we manage the employability of young people altogether as societies, as employers, as workers' representatives, as young people, as parents of young people, in the best possible way for as many of the young people in our societies to be well employable. And of course, there is an element of information, information about where are the jobs, what kind of jobs are available on our labor markets, because young people need to, do, to know that when they make their choices. But there is also the element of personal choice, and the young people need to be able to decide for themselves what is best for them in their working life, which is a very important time of transition in their lives. Um, so, I mean, having said all this, I think the situation remains hopeful because of the, the essence of where we are in societies with demographic aging for the young people. I think that there is also um, a lot that can be done to improve in terms of this twin challenge of um, the, uh, the, the, the current crisis, but also having in mind the labor and skill shortages. And now pointing to exactly what you were asking, what is effective? Um, I'll focus on a few of, of what we think very um, effective ways of dealing uh, with the situation first. And there we have a bit of a difference with TEA. We think that the possibilities for young people to work in diverse forms of employment is crucial. So um, this is about providing choice. I think what was said before in terms of the young people compared to the previous generations having different expectations um, is something that we need to be aware of. But at the same time, of course, it's also about ensuring that whatever the employment status, whatever the, the type of jobs, um, we are ensuring, and that we have a role as well as social partners, that we have a good balance in terms of the working conditions element and in terms of the access to employment element. So we need to work on both. And there is a responsibility for us as social partners to find the right approaches to this with the governments. Um, but um, very important for the transition is, of course, apprenticeships and traineeships. So, I mean, I want to say a quick word on both. On apprenticeships, we think as employers that it is crucial for employability because the young people, they are trained directly for a job. And so when they get out of the apprenticeship, the likelihood for them to get into a job is very high. So that's very important because it makes it very successful rates. Um, on apprenticeship, the issue is that we have a good framework. We have uh, a council recommendation um, back in 2018. Um, it's been implemented and it's um, uh, being rolled out. The issue we are facing here is that the commission is at the end of um, a support service contract um, with an external contractor and we hear that it may not be renewed. So a key message from us to DG Employment is please renew it. You need to continue acting for young people with apprenticeships. You need to continue doing bench learning on member states' reforms agenda and in fact intensify it because during the COVID period it has been a challenge and we acknowledge it. The second point is relating to traineeships. I mean, we hear that um, the trade unions, but also in the European Parliament, there is an increasing um, appetite to, to look into the issue. Um, and um, the clear message on our side here is that this is not about European legislation. Um, we have a quality framework on traineeships, and um, it's being looked at, and we are, of course, willing to look at it. Um, but it's important to provide different options for traineeships, because traineeships, they are a good way for young people to test a job. And testing a job means that when you have done education in higher education, for example, and you are considering different options, you may choose something else than what you do in a traineeship in the first place. Or you may choose to confirm and, and try to access to a job. But, I mean, it's an investment also from the employer's side to provide an opportunity for someone that is not yet very employable and, and with the skills that are really needed for the jobs, but to have a chance to explore and to um, have a, a relevant labor market experience that makes it stronger for the young people to get access to a job. So this value needs to be not underestimated.
And I, I, I think we have also a slightly different view with the trade union colleagues in terms of the difference between this labor market participation in the transition, which is indeed a challenge and we recognize it, but it is positive because the young people, they are in the prospect of getting access to a job. They are learning um, by doing. Um, compared to the long-term unemployed young people. There it's a key issue, of course, because they have a big risk of not being able to participate in employment, and we can see that the challenge is harder when it lasts for longer. So really the focus should be in trying to help all the young people where I started. The needs, rates need to reduce, particularly in Southern Europe, where they are very high, and we need to support the member states as commission and working with the social partners to make the best of this generation of young people. And of course, isolation is an issue that um, we have seen and we are aware of, but we need to give the signal that there is a place for the young people in our societies and labor markets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maxime. Thank you very much. I'm very conscious of time. We started a bit late. I know we are already, uh, we have caught up with our timing, but um, we have received some questions online. So I'm turning to the organizers. I don't want to uh, completely force you to skip your coffee break. I know we're streamed, therefore we are, um, we are limited in time with the streaming. We don't want to continue. So can somebody give me an indication whether we can take five more minutes or no? Can you just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Thumbs up? Okay. So, uh, re no? Down, sorry. From that side, it's down. Sorry. So, I couldn't see. So, well, I'm awfully sorry that we have to cut short um, our discussion, but we have an eight minutes or seven minutes now coffee break. Uh, but thank you very much for being with us. We have received some questions online, so maybe I will give them to you so that uh, we, can, uh, we can exchange later on. Thanks very much for following this session. Thank you all three for joining us this morning. Thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and let us continue with the second part of our breakout session, looking at young people and commenting on the report published by the European Commission. Um, in this session, we'll look more specifically at uh, some of the impacts left by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And we'll focus on the scars that it has left on young people. We have already mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the isolation and the mental health issues, uh, but we'll be looking also into learning losses uh, that they've had to face and the opportunities that after all have uh, in the end emerged. So it's not all completely uh, black and bleak. Um, but now, in the recovery from uh, the pandemic, we have noticed that the conditions weren't even. The recovery was not the same in various parts and in various circles for young people. The under 30s in particular still face very significant challenges, whether it's in terms of labor markets or education. So we'd like to hear from you on Slido this time again, and let me connect to our question. Um, in your opinion, what do young people think is the best way of dealing with the economic downturns in terms of labor market prospects? So we have heard there's no right or wrong answer. It's just, you know, what, what your feeling is. We've mentioned this uh, particular aspect before. Would you prefer uh, or do young people prefer to face a deep and short recession or do you think they prefer to face a mild and longer recession? Uh, and we'll look at the results after um, the general presentation. Two 
take us through this general presentation, uh, I'd like to invite Gabor Kate and Jakub Zeisel from the European Commission DG Employment, uh, who are co-authors of the chapter. So, thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, in what follows, uh, we will br briefly present uh, uh, some of the key challenges faced by young people in the aftermath of the uh, COVID crisis, uh, as well as some opportunities uh, in the context of uh, digital transition. Uh, sorry, this is the first slide. Uh, during economic crisis or recessions in general, uh, the young, pe young people are hit particularly hard compared to prime age individuals or other generations. So this is because uh, uh, during economic crisis, uh, uh, it is very important uh, the, uh, when they start their career. Uh, so the first year or the first few years uh, when they enter the labor market uh, is, is a key uh, period in uh, young people's life and career. Uh, and when they enter in bad times, bad economic uh, times during recessions, for instance, they have higher probability of being unemployed or inactive, or they might force, forcefully take up uh, temporary jobs, uh, uh, lower paid jobs, uh, or uh, uh, they might be overqualified uh, for the job they take. Uh, take. Uh, and uh, uh, this can have a long-lasting effect, impact uh, on young. This is the so-called scaring effect because it can influence uh, over the medium or long run uh, their future labor market prospects. Uh, <clears throat> this is what we are interested in here. This is the so-called scaring effect. So what the most interesting questions nowadays, what, what will happen to young people uh, after the COVID recession? Because the COVID recession was particularly sharp, as you've seen in the previous uh, session. Uh, but uh, we had basically a very quick recovery so far. Uh, and of course, we, we don't see the future. We cannot predict. Uh, we have to use, in that case, uh, uh, past experience. Uh, so we collected data for, for the 27 current EU countries uh, back to the 60s and looked at the recessions period. There are over 100 recessions period during uh, this time frame in overall in the 27 countries and looked at what happened to young people relative to prime age individuals. So everything in terms, uh, we, we, we present is in relative terms. So we are specifically interested uh, in the specific effect on young people. And these are the results uh, that, uh, that you see on the slide. Uh, the, uh, the zero at the x-axis in each graph represents the last year of, of the crisis. Uh, and uh, one, two, three, up to 15 years, uh, we can see how uh, the specific labor market outcome uh, evolved for young people relative to prime age individuals. For example, let's look at the uh, upper left-hand side graph. Uh, it shows the activity rate in percentage point. Uh, more precisely, the shock to the activity rate for young people relative to prime age individuals after a general, uh, an average uh, recession in, in Europe. We can see that three years after the recession, uh, the activity rate deteriorates more uh, for young people than for prime age individuals by about 1.5 percentage point. This is the blue line. Uh, the light uh, band you see is the uncertainty because this is an estimation and, and naturally there is an uncertainty involved uh, here. And we can see that this is very persistent. Uh, after an average recession, up to six years, uh, the, the, the labor market uh, outcome, the activity rate, for instance, do not recover for uh, young people, uh, but it can take much longer, up to 12 or 11, uh, 11 12 years uh, after the recession. So this is a very, very persistent effect. We see uh, on the uh, middle upper graph, uh, the employment rate, we have the similar, similar pattern, pattern. Uh, on the left-hand side upper graph, the unemployment rate is increasing uh, more for, for young people than prime age individuals, and the recovery is very, very slow. Uh, it can take, again, uh, six years or so. And in the bottom graphs, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, young people are also impacted at the so-called intensive margin. That is how much they, they work. If they work, how much they work during the year. 
Uh, so, for example, the share of part-time workers are also impacted. It increases after uh, the re recession and recovers slowly. Involuntary uh, part-time uh, part workers also, and also share of temporary workers increases. So, overall, it has a very uh, long-lasting effect after an average recession. But, of course, not all recessions are the same. There are deeper recessions, uh, shorter recessions, milder, uh, and uh, um, so, sorry, uh, deeper, milder, or shorter, longer recessions. And of course, deeper recessions are naturally uh, worse for young people than milder recessions. Also, longer recessions are worse uh, for young people than, uh, than shorter recessions. But the interesting question, the, the most interesting question here, uh, the question that we asked on the slide as well, uh, if we compare mild and long recessions with deep and short recessions, what you, what, which one is the worst for young people? Uh, do, those who uh, were present in the previous uh, session already know the answers. Uh, for those who did not attend the previous sessions, uh, this is, uh, these two graphs gives you the answer. We compared uh, so the mild and long, long recessions on the left-hand side uh, with the deep and short recessions on the right-hand side, and we can see that the mild and long recessions uh, after a mild and long recession, uh, the, the uh, labor market performance, in that case the employment rate, uh, deteriorates much more for young people uh, than in a deep and short recession scenario. Uh, and the deep and short recession scenario, actually, we don't even see uh, on average a difference between uh, young people and prime age individuals. Uh, what does it mean uh, in terms of the current COVID crisis? Uh, so far, uh, the COVID crisis uh, uh, brought a deep recession, but the recovery was very fast. So, so, so far we are more uh, in the deep and short recession scenario, which is a good sign uh, because we do not expect uh, uh, long-lasting labor market uh, deterioration for young people. Uh, but as Pierre Kayuk in the previous session also mentioned, the, the outlook is not very favorable uh, in general and especially for young people. Uh, because uh, because of the new shock uh, due to inflation and the reaction of the monetary policy, the U Ukrainian crisis, etc., and so we can uh, we may find ourselves uh, in the mild and uh, long recession scenario, or even worse, a deep and uh, long recession scenario. In which case, uh, uh, the labor market uh, uh, prospects for young people will deteriorate probably uh, for a much longer period. And I give the floor now to uh, my colleague, Jakub, who will discuss a little bit uh, other aspects of the current crisis and the ongoing economic transition. transition. Thank yes. you. Yes. yes, I will now briefly walk you through some particular uh, aspects of the COVID-19 crisis that gathered a lot of attention and discuss their impacts for young people. So first, let's look at the school closures, which were already pick up, uh, picked up in the main session. And from the main session, we, we kind of know that these were widespread and they were particularly severe in the beginning of the pandemic. What I want to, I, here I will go a little bit deeper. So first on, the, on this chart uh, that you can see behind me, this gives the percentage of regular instruction days that took place in different countries. And what you can see from this chart quite clearly is that there was quite a bit of variation across countries in terms of school closures. So for example, when you look at the academic year 2020, 2021, marked in yellow, you can see that in some countries, Virtually, in-person education was not disturbed. But if you look at other countries, you can see that no in -person almost no in-person education took place. Now, we all know that in-person education was replaced by various forms of hybrid and distant uh, education. But there were still quite a bit of concerns that this can lead to learning losses. Basically, that the distant forms of learning are less uh, effective. Uh, we, uh, to explore this, we reviewed uh, a range of national studies that was available at the time of uh, writing of the report, and we found a mixed evidence of this. So in some countries, and some subjects in particular, uh, there, were, there was evidence of significant learning loss, sometimes even equal to a couple of months learning. But in other countries, uh, there, was no, there was no such evidence in, in other subjects. Uh, what the studies that did find uh, learning losses had in common is that these were typically concentrated among students from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, exacerbating existing inequalities in educational systems. Uh, on the other hand, we also saw, uh, on the more hopeful side, we saw a lot of mitigation measures adopted across member states uh, concerning learning loss, 
And these were, typic these were very often targeted at students from disadvantaged backgrounds, but their effectiveness remains to be seen. Uh, the other aspect of the crisis that I want to walk you through is the, is the way it accelerated digitalization, notably by the shift to telework and uh, increasing importance of uh, associated digital technologies and notably uh, digital skills. Uh, to have a look at how young people fare in terms of digital skills, we developed uh, so what we call a digital skills intensity index, which basically for each occupation measures uh, the proportion of all necessary skills in that occupation that are digital. And here in this chart uh, behind me, you can see the results in terms of digital intensity, which are plotted against EU average, so relative to EU average. To illustrate this, you can look, for example, at the light blue bar, which denotes young men with tertiary education, and you can see that their digital intensity of work is roughly twice the EU average. Now, from this chart, I first want to highlight that young people, their digital intensity is slightly higher than for, uh, than for uh, adults and older workers, which are denoted by the black, and black signs in the chart. But this effect uh, uh, is limited to those who have tertiary education. You can see that by age, if you go lower than tertiary education achievement, there is not much of a difference. The other thing that I want to highlight here is that there are important uh, divides in digital intensity of work by gender and by uh, educational attainment. So on this chart, you can clearly see that digital intensity of work declines sharply with educational uh, achievement. And you can also see that there is a considerable gap among young tertiary educated men and women in terms of digital intensity of their work. And what we found is that this is very closely linked to representation of or, or to profiles of workers in STEM occupations, which are some of the by far most digitally intensive uh, occupations out there. And we know that in these occupations, uh, there is very high shares of tertiary educated workers, and most of them are men, even among young people. I think this should be enough to uh, kind of prepare the ground for the discussion, which I'm very much looking forward to. You can have a look at more findings from the report here, and I will now hand over to back to Florence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you for taking us through uh, that indeed uh, very interesting chapter. And I know we're going to have some comments, but before we do so, let's look at the results of our Slido poll. Uh, no surprise there. Of course, young people prefer to have to face a deep and short recession uh, because it seems to them, and the results of the study have proven it, that it is easier and the impact, of course, is not as deep uh, on, their, on their labor market access. So uh, let's turn now to our panelists to continue the discussion. And it's a pleasure to welcome with us this morning Martin Kahanek, who is the head of Department of Public Policy at the Central Europe University, Daniele Kecki, who is Professor of Economics at the University of Milan. And joining us online this morning, we have with us Sandra McNally, who is Professor of Economics at the University of Surrey. Good morning and welcome to you all. Um, Martin, I, I'd like to turn to you first because we, have, we know that the current EU labour market is very tense and particularly so for young people. Um, in parallel, they're facing a number of economic uncertainties due to the uh, conflict in Ukraine in particular. How do you see this EU labour market developing, let's say mid-term, uh, specifically for young people and also in the context of displaced people from the Ukraine? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question and congratulations on a very informative and uh, rich uh, report. Now, when you think about the overall situation, what we've seen was that the COVID pandemic uh, hurt young generations, and this was about their human capital, and we could see that the non-pharmaceutical non measures, such as lockdowns and school closures, hurt their on-site education. Uh, but it's also about their social capital, about their mental health, and so those and those effects were uh, very heavy for the uh, young people. And on top of that, we see presently that their prospects, the economic prospects are worsening. Okay? We still see very tight labor markets, 
in most countries. But at the same time, we see economic slowdown looming, we see increasing uh, price of uh, capital, uncertain uncertainties, energy crisis, and this does not help the young people. But precisely, when you think from a different angle mm, about these challenges, uh, it's the young people who are the most entrepreneurial, who can take some risks, who may be adapting. And we could see this also in the diagrams that you show that after some initial hit and shock, there was adaptation and it's, um, they, are very, they are relatively mobile. Yes? So th th there is a potential for, for them to adjust and adapt, but also for the, 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 in, in doing that, they will be helping European societies to, to adjust. So their role is crucial for turning crises into opportunities, if I, if I, if I, if I frame it in that uh, way, and putting on a, on a more positive trajectory. Now, from the public policy perspective, of course, that potential needs to be un unlocked, yes, in, in, in many aspects. And now coming, coming to the, 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 the now, this is the context, but then there is the influx of Ukraine, uh, from, from, of displaced people from Ukraine. And on the first side, that could be seen as, a, as a competing workers entering uh, European labor markets. But when you see what's happening is that, well, in the tense markets, the demand for their, for their labor is rather high, and also in the countries which are receiving most of the immigrants. Uh, but what we see as well is that uh, there are certain arrangements which are pushing them into precarity, undeclared work. And, and there I see a big role for public policy to actually enable and empower the Ukrainian uh, well, refugees from Ukraine and these people displaced from Ukraine to actually uh, uh, grease the wheels of European economies and by doing that also uh, help uh, European uh, youth to actually uh, find uh, find uh, find employment and um, employment opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we we will continue this discussion, but before we do so, we'd like to reach out to you and see what you think um, about the learning losses that uh, we will touch upon now. And in your view, did school closures have a negative impact on the learning loss and the long-term labor market prospects? Now, there's no correct answer there either. It's really a matter of how you feel. So, no, there was no implication. Yes, but they will catch up only for children from a disadvantaged background or yes, and they will not be recovered. We give you a few minutes. We'll come back to the results after uh, we have continued our discussion for a little while. Um, Daniele, I'm, I'm turning to you because this uh, ESD report has indeed looked at the impact of school closures that we have uh, just uh, asked our Slido question about. And learning losses and labor market outcomes uh, or labor market will feel the impact of these uh, learning losses. There's no consensus apparently on the extent of learning loss. Uh, and we have heard that uh, from, from the report that some, some of these losses were more clear in some parts uh, and, and not obvious at all in others. Um, so the, um, the groups of young people uh, that were affected, which are they? Do, do you think there were certain groups that were more affected than others? Thank you. It's not an easy question to be answered. But, um, let me first congratulate with the authors uh, of the chapter. It's very intriguing. Uh, and let me bring into the discussion a point which has not yet been raised. Uh, the COVID crisis had a polarizing effect among the youth. The young people are not all alike. Uh, we know from there are tons of studies where inequality of opportunity is affecting the different stages of the educational career. It, the, 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 the authors didn't have time to show uh, you in a very interesting graph where they do decompose the inequality of opportunity by type of circumstances. But uh, if the people were here in the previous session, they saw a map where there was the effect of parental education in different countries. The point is that because of uh, uh, um, parental background does affect uh, the preschooling, the choice of track, the early school leaving, the transition to tertiary education. Obviously, uh, whenever uh, we have a common shock, 
people do react in, in different ways, not only by social origin, but also, for example, by regional differences. Um, the COVID was not hitting at the same way the different regions, and the different regions were uh, differently affected. Let me give you an example from uh, my country. The south of the country was not hit by, by the uh, pandemic compared to the north. Nevertheless, uh, the school closures was much higher in the south than in the north. So the, the mitigating effect that you were referring to uh, should be uh, taken into account if you want to measure the pure effect of the COVID. A second mitigating effect, um, they, uh, many countries do have retention of students when they fail to reach the expected level. In many countries, the retention went to zero during the COVID years. So we will not be able to detect the pure effect of the COVID because of this uh, confounding factor, which is the attitude of the teacher toward the, toward the student. Bringing all together, uh, we, we see uh, that uh, the weaker students uh, are probably those who had more problem in reacting to the crisis. We know that digital competencies are quite differently distributed uh, in the population of students, and those who were forced to stay home in larger houses, good bandwidth connection, uh, good uh, computer equipment, they were able to improve their competencies during the crisis. Otherwise, uh, students who were cohabiting uh, with many siblings uh, in uh, small houses where the quality of the connection was quite low and uh, the connection was shared by many people and so the, the individual connection was weak, they probably uh, had a, 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 a permanent damages. The estimates uh, based on uh, student testing in my country uh, gives a, an amount of uh, six months of loss in terms of schooling due, due to the COVID. But uh, the damages are uh, on, on three grounds, in my view. The first one is obviously the loss of human capital. The second one has been mentioned by Romina in the previous session, is the problem of psychological damage. Uh, the Italian government was forced to introduce a psychological bonus in order to offer free access to psychologists for a couple of meetings to all the students who are claiming to suffer some psychological loss uh, during the COVID period. In addition, a third dimension, uh, which is also hitting uh, the young uh, workers, is that the, the COVID that didn't hit all the sectors in the same way. Typically, uh, young people start working in restaurants and pubs. Well, this was the sector who suffered more, with a decline in the order of 30% in one year. So also the job opportunity that were offered, and I, I think that part of the graph uh, uh, where you do compare a short and deep crisis uh, uh, with uh, long uh, and mild ones, is probably due to this uh, sectoral allocation of the youth. Uh, to close, uh, uh, what is happening to the young uh, after the COVID looks quite similar to what is happening with the smart working opportunities. Who is taking advantage of the smart working? The people who are highly educated, the good jobs, who can say, home and protect themselves more, while the other type of workers are typically exposed to the risk of the contagion, the risk of unemployment, to the risk of income losses. Here, among the young people, uh, the uh, situation looks quite similar. Indeed. Sandra, we, we heard from Jakob in the presentation of the report a few minutes ago that uh, there's a, a definite gender gap in terms of uh, digital intensity, and especially among those who achieved uh, tertiary education. So you have researched uh, the choices of educational fields amongst uh, young women and men. And on that basis, how, how do you think the, uh, these differences contribute to the gender gap in terms of digital intensity? 
Um, okay, thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. And uh, it sounds like a really interesting event and uh, congratulations on the report. Um, but in answer to your question, I'm going to really draw on a literature review I did um, in 2020 for the European Expert Network um, on the economics of education, um, looking at gender gaps in STEM more generally, but that includes technology. And I would say that um, gap in the gender intensity of using technology at work um, reflects um, or, or reflects at the, the people going into um, relevant fields um, in, in tertiary education as fields of study. Um, and or also the similar causes, even if it's not directly uh, related to field of study. But just to touch on field of study for a second, if you look at the um, share of people who, who are tertiary educated, who do information and communication technologies um, in all countries, in all European countries, this is from UNESCO data, uh, you see there's a much, huge gender gaps um, in, in all countries. Um, every single country where the, the share of uh, women doing information and communication technologies is rarely um, over 2%, uh, whereas for uh, men, it's more in the region of 8% um, in many countries and goes up to 14% in places like Estonia and also pretty high in Finland and in a few countries where it's um, uh, reasonably high. Um, so, so why is that? Why, why do um, that, that's something that isn't new? It's not related to the pandemic or anything like that. Um, uh, why is that? Well, it's unlikely to be due to people's um, actual skills and uh, abilities um, in things like maths or science in the PISA. Data would suggest that that abilities on those sorts of subjects. I know that's not digital subjects, but STEM type subjects um, are not um, not that unequal between uh, boys and girls when they're young. Um, but I would say the literature review points to gender stereotypes being particularly important. And that appears in different guises. Um, it affects how people see um, themselves um, it and therefore their self-efficacy in different subjects, despite the fact they may be very good at it. And um, it affects how teachers see them. And it also affects how people see particular fields. Um, and this is something that psychologists emphasize a lot in regard to technology. Um, they say that um, a lot of their research would suggest that um, when they're, um, they see computer science and engineering as stereotyped as male oriented fields that involve social isolation and intensive focus on machinery and inborn brilliance, um, and I'm quoting all of which are qualities typically more valued by men than by women. Um, so that sort of culture and that sort of perception of what the culture is uh, really doesn't help women um, want to enter those fields, particularly in view of the fact that in, they may not have that much knowledge in university of what those fields actually involve. The good news is that there is evidence, quite good evidence, both from economics and from psychology, about what can be done about it. Um, this includes uh, female role models in tertiary education. And then if you try and change that by having more female role models, then hopefully the culture will also change. Um, the psychologists I mentioned do mention a few um, universities, uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University of Washington, um, Harvey Mudd, um, uh, where they had uh, made some radical changes um, and they got a huge increase in enrollment of female computer science graduates. Um, so those changes included some structural changes to recruitment, but also involved um, changing uh, the stereotypes of computer science by using diverse role models. Um, and exposing students to a wide range of applications for computer science and revamping their introductory course. So it wasn't no longer seen as a field um, uh, for, um, for, for in, in a very stereotypical way. Um, so, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm now going to um, ask Martin a question, but I'd like to ask you actually, and, and, and uh, um, Daniele and Sandra as well, with that particular question to give us a very short answer, because I really, really would like to have the chance of taking at least one question from the audience at the end. And we're already running a bit late, even though we started on time. Um, so Martin, a very brief answer. Um, we've seen that the share of people who are, of young people who are not either in employment, education, or training uh, in 
in the EU is still quite high and uh, social mobility, particularly in the South, is quite low. So how could policy help these young people in their transition from uh, education to the work market? Thank you. So it's a very big question, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I'll, I'll give you some reflections on this. Uh, one reflection is that from the data and from analysis we see that uh, one of the problems is that students have little work experience and that's hurting their school to work transition because when you look at vac uh, vacancies, uh, you know that uh, many, many vacancies in Hungary when we studied this, 70% so of vacancies are actually open to fresh graduates, but only 5% uh, to, to graduates with, uh, with uh, with up to three years of experience, but only 5% are open to fresh graduates going straight from, uh, from, from school. And uh, we could see a big role of uh, language um, as a uh, language is knowledge of uh, other languages as a limiting factor. We could see that uh, even though in, uh, in, in, in corporations there are many entry jobs that require certain uh, qualifications, but the uh, uh, micro entrepreneurial sectors and SME sectors are underdeveloped and, 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 and they, they are failing to integrate uh, young people into uh, employment. What we also saw that soft skills played a big role, and there was actually a very gendered role. Just to give an example, women with lower education uh, more than others benefited from ability to present themselves, communicate on strengths and achievements. So many factors. Now the question is what kind of policies? Well, uh, also in relation to the pandemic and the loss of human capital, reskilling and lifelong, lifelong learning uh, would be a beneficial uh, reforms which would enable students to already gain some experience uh, on uh, and hands on learning. Uh, healthcare is also important because uh, what also Daniela said is some, I see a big role of youth to actually adapt but then there are some who may be left behind and who have been hurt uh, in, in terms of their mental health and that's very important to compensate. Uh, access to capital for those with more entrepreneurial ambitions, uh, that's uh, another uh, important uh, policy. And I probably stop here to give room to other speakers. Thank you. Thank you. So a few hints already. Um, Sandra, we, you already touched upon that in your, in your previous answer, but um, how, how do the different educational choices made by uh, young women and men translate into uh, their differences once they work, once they are in the labour market? Um, well, that's, that's, a, that's a very easy question to answer in a way. Um, the, the fact that um, women do, are less likely to choose these STEM subjects um, mm -hmm. than men means that um, is, is a reason for the gender earnings gap. Um, there are many empirical mm -hmm. studies that show that, prove that uh, with data. So it's not just a question of my opinion. Um, it, it's, it's actually true um, in, in studies. So it's, it's not, of course, the only reason for uh, earnings gaps uh, between men and women, but it is um, um, an important one. Uh, so it's really important to try to um, address that. Um, it's also important when, pe when people leave the labour market for a while, which is often women, that there are training opportunities available to help people um, equip themselves to go back into things um, because technological change is such that things do change quickly. So retraining uh, the opportunity to reskill um, is quite important for people who leave the labour market for a while. So not just thinking about recruiting women into more fields, but also trying to retain them in those fields if they leave for breaks um, is an important issue as well. Thank you. And um, Daniele, also a brief answer uh, on, on my next point, and I know um, the, uh, the answer could be very long, but uh, what's in your view the, the main impact of lockdowns on students? Um, it depends whether we are speaking about secondary school student or tertiary stu school student. Um, Tertiary education. Okay, tertiary education, I, I'm not uh, fearing uh, uh, big losses for three reasons. The first one is that uh, university college enrollment is counter-cyclical. Uh, and therefore, during a recession, people who do not know what to do, they tend to go to school. And so this is contrasting. The second one is that uh, the massive uh, uh, recourse uh, to online uh, teaching uh, 
is giving an advantage, uh, especially if people is able to adjust their, let's say, part-time working and part-time studying. And the third one is uh, that uh, uh, there, there have been an increase in the massive supply of uh, mock courses, even in European universities, which is uh, a, a, a another opportunity. What we do not know is uh, whether the COVID have stopped or speed up uh, the uh, mobility of students across Europe. It would be very interesting in understanding whether Erasmus, for example, have expanded or contracted, and in addition, brain drain or brain gain in the young segment of the labor force uh, is increasing. Okay, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be studies about that indeed uh, in, a in the near future. Um, let's look quickly at the result of our Slido poll, and the outcome is actually not that uh, clear cut. So, for a majority of people, yes. Uh, there were, the school closures did have a negative impact on uh, the learning loss and, and labor market, uh, but only for children from disadvantaged backgrounds, and that's for 38%. So almost as many, 35%, thought that uh, the, the people, the, the children and students who were affected by the school closures will catch up, which is a, a little bit more optimistic uh, and, and compensating somehow some of the things that we have heard. Um, I have here received a few questions online, and I'm going to take at least the first one um, so that we can still continue our discussion for a few minutes. Um, the first question, young people with disabilities suffer the worst employment rates, activity or poverty risks However, they haven't been mentioned. Um, is there, do we have any advice in that sense? Maybe I can turn to the authors of the chapter to see whether there was any specific study or part of the study carried out uh, related to young people with disabilities? Yeah, so, uh, sorry, I, we did not have time to go f uh, much through what we meant by uh, children from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds, I think, when we were mentioning the impacts of school closures. So I think I will take it a little bit, little bit broader in this sense. So when we talked about children in disadvantaged backgrounds and the COVID closures being particularly severe from them, this indeed includes uh, children with, disability, with disabilities because they, I, I think from the studies that we saw, there was some indication that they, uh, that they faced particular, uh, uh, particular challenges, uh, for example, in attending online learning or getting the kind of support that they are used to in, learn, in, in, regular, in regular learning. Uh, I think the other groups that we found in these disadvantaged, in this, uh, in this disadvantaged uh, student, uh, with students with disadvantaged backgrounds was people, uh, was children from low-income families where it, was, uh, where it was difficult to get, say, appropriate tools. Also, uh, children with parents with low, uh, lower educational attainment, where it might have been difficult to uh, support uh, children appropriate, uh, appropriately. And I think I will leave it there. That's just to illustrate the kind of uh, groups that we meant when, when, when we Thank you. Do we have a question in the room? Yes, so at the first hand was the one at the back there, the gentleman on the third row. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry, I, I can't see. <laughs> All no I worries. see is a hand. <laughs> no worries. Hello, everyone. Gabriela Sutton, Policy and Practice Officer at EuroHealthNet. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for the very insightful discussion so far. And I'd like to draw in on a point that was mentioned in the previous panel session, reflecting on COVID-19 pandemic also being a well-being pandemic. Similarly, the cost of living crisis that we're currently navigating through is also a well-being uh, pandemic. So this really showcases that investments in well-being are crucial to make sure that youth participation is at the forefront and that we invest in all particular settings, including the workplace setting. So my question is, as a young European worker, what is being done or what needs to be done to make sure that investments and policies are going in this direction focusing on our health and well-being to make sure that we are supported when it comes to youth participation in the workforce. Thank you. Who would like to take that question? <laughs> That's always... Yeah, Daniele. Uh, um, I think that the, the generation who has been hit should be compensated. 
I don't know whether through a bonus uh, later on in the retirement scheme or uh, today. The problem is identifying who are uh, the beneficiaries because what is the age range of those who are to be compensated? And in addition, why this crisis and not the previous one? Uh, that is uh, the, the problem in identifying those who really suffered uh, from a policy-making point of view. Otherwise, I think that uh, the, in a sense, most of the European government uh, with the bonuses, uh, special support and so on, were quite active in trying to attenuate the effect of the crisis. And this is probably why the, the immediate uh, rebound uh, in terms of employment uh, was so quick compared to the previous ones. Thank you. One quick question, and please, yeah, we have two there. I think the gentleman at the front raised his hand first. Excuse me, the very, f the very front row? Yes, thank you. Well, just, well thank you, um, Bear Ullman, European Specialist Nurses Organization. Um, we are talking very much about the younger generation, but uh, we also uh, need to emphasize on the seniority in the health domain, because that's where the outflows go. So without seniority, without mentoring, we see at least a quarter a drop out of the young professionals coming in because there is no mentoring. And if you do not support this mentoring, so I really uh, encourage the European uh, Commission just to also to emphasize on the generation in the 40s, in the 50s, to support, the, uh, to support them. So it's more of a comment. Thank you. Well, I think that's going to have to be the very final comment then, uh, so that we give all of you time to change room if you would like to move to another session for the final part of our, uh, of our morning. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. Sandra, thank you for joining us online this morning. And have a very nice rest of the day. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back, and uh, it's time to move to the third part already of our uh, overall session related to young people. And we'll explore the living conditions of the young, which as we heard in the very first Slido poll we had, is a very important topic uh, and, a, and a very important preoccupation uh, for not only for young people, but for all of us, uh, one way or another. We will discuss now who benefits and who struggles and we've heard how the labor income of uh, young people is more volatile than it is for older workers. So we'll go more in depth into the issue and we'll look at the gender aspect uh, of that volatility and we'll also try to understand and try maybe to uh, suggest how policy can help improve the living conditions of the young. So let's start with our first Slido question for that particular part and turn to you again. What do you see as the most pressing challenge for young people's living conditions in the post-pandemic recovery? Is it uncertainty? Is it housing affordability? Is it social mobility or poverty? Uh, we'll have the results, as always, in a few moments. But for now, I'd like to first invite our next speakers to present the dedicated chapter of the report, um, which is dedicated to living conditions of young people, outcomes and prospects. And please welcome Carolina Gralek and again, uh, Jakub Teisel, who are co-authors of this particular chapter. Many thanks. So in the presentation of the session, I would like to show you some particular um, selected results from this year's Employment and Social Development in Europe review, uh, which focus on the living conditions of young people and also their prospects looking ahead. Uh, in the earlier two sessions today, we already uh, saw some specific findings showing that 
young people belong to those groups that they are affected by the pandemic the most. However, some vulnerabilities that young people face actually were already present even way before the COVID crisis. And one of those vulnerabilities is the larger labor income volatility among young people. As you can see here on the slide, uh, the labor income volatility for young people, here depicted in green, uh, are actually higher compared to the older workers, here in blue, both in annual terms, but also from one month to another. Our analysis shows that most of this volatility has negative effects for young people, and this is because they're mostly driven by more frequent uh, precarious employment among young people, but also increasing transitions out of employment and also into education and training. Now, you may ask, why do we care so much about this higher volatility? Uh, well, first of all, um, the larger labor income volatility among young people translates into larger market income volatility of young people. And this uh, may actually lead to higher poverty rates. Indeed, we saw that in the period between 2013 and 2018, one out of five young households faced chronic poverty meaning that their market income was below the poverty line in at least three out of four years. Secondly, uh, the, the higher labor income inequality and also volatility contributed to a decrease in home ownership rates. And we touched upon this already a bit during the first session. So this decrease in home ownership le uh, rates leads to the fact that young people nowadays um, accumulate lower levels of wealth compared to the older generations, and this actually limits uh, their ability um, to draw on existing assets in case of economic distress. And due to this, um, the tax benefit systems play a very significant role in supplementing young people's market incomes, but also in reducing the volatility of their income flows. Before the pandemic, so back in 2019, the share of benefits in pre-tax income was twice as high for young people compared to the overall population. And during the pandemic, we all know that member states adopted many measures, and our analysis shows that those measures had a comparatively stronger impact for young people. Indeed, you can see this on the slide if you compare the blue dot, which looks at the disposable income, including all the benefits, and the green dot, which only looks at disposable income without benefits. You see that in 2020, these distances, so the share of benefits in pre-tax income, was higher for young people in all the countries, with one exception of Poland. In addition, you can also see that um, the disposable income, including the benefits, was actually higher than pre-tax income in some particular member states like France or Greece. Um, and this actually made a very big difference to what happened during the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. There are such exceptional measures were not adopted and we actually saw a negative impact on young people's disposable income. Now, to achieve the inclusiveness of young people also in the post-pandemic recovery and even further in the longer term, it is very important to ensure that individual characteristics that are acquired at birth, so meaning that, that they are outside of individual control, that they do not determine future outcomes. And to measure this, we look at the inequality of opportunity indicator. This indicator summarizes uh, what would be the level of labor income inequality if it were only determined by those external circumstances, such as gender, country of birth, parental background, or family composition. And in the table, we can see that parental background actually plays a key role in determining young people's inequality in income. And in particular, parental education and parental occupation together account for more than a half of the overall inequality of opportunity. Now, over time, uh, the relative weight of um, those external factors changed, and we saw that after the financial crisis, so here in the table since 2011, um, the relative role of gender and parental education has actually increased. And now my colleague Jakob will guide you through some particular aspects of inequality. Uh, inequalities and opportunities translate to in practice in the labor market. Uh, we uh, had a deeper look at gender pay gap uh, among uh, young workers at the start of their careers, that is workers aged 25 uh, to 29. 
And you can see the results in, in the chart on the slide, uh, slide behind me, where it, the black line uh, denotes the gender pay gap as expressed in terms of percentage of male hourly salary. So in the middle, roughly in the middle of the chart, you can see the EU levels, and from there you can see that even at the start, at the very start of young people's career, uh, young men tend to earn on average 7.2% more uh, than young women. You can, also, uh, you can also see from the chart that we try to establish what proportion of this difference can be explained by differences in average worker characteristics uh, of uh, young working men and women, such as uh, the fields they work in or uh, the type of education they, they achieved. And from the chart, this is in dark blue in the chart, you can see that at EU level, uh, these average differences in characteristics actually explain very little, uh, which is a bit misleading though, because there are some characteristics that do affect pay in significant ways, they just, they just work in different directions. So for, for young men, uh, young men on average earn about three percentage points more because they work in highly paid, uh, higher paid economic activities Whereas for young women, they tend to be better educated when entering, uh, on average when entering the labor market and therefore, therefore earn more. Um, the challenge remains that most of the, the most of the pay gap, you can see that in light green in the chart, is unexplained by these differences in characteristics and it's linked to other factors. So this can be, for example, uh, segregation in educational fields that young workers take prior to entering the labor market probably links also to undervaluation of certain types of uh, women's work, different types of discrimination and stereotypes and, and other factors. The other thing that I want to show here today is to illustrate how inequalities uh, in opportunity can start working from very young ages, as was already previous highlighted in the previous panel. And in, uh, for this, we had a look at participation in early childhood education and care, where we know that uh, there is a grow, growing body of literature now that shows that participating in early childhood education and care from very early ages leads uh, to uh, better future educational outcomes and by extension also to better employment outcomes, even though there the link is it's much more long term. Uh, and this is true, and this is true particularly for children uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds, such as uh, children at risk of poverty or social exclusion. Now, what you can see in the, chart, uh, on the, uh, in the chart on the slide behind me is uh, quite concerning in this, in, in, in this respect because you can see that children at risk of poverty or social exclusion, that's the light blue bars, participate usually less than children, uh, uh, than children not at risk, denoted by the black diamond. And this is particularly uh, severe uh, for children under three years of age. So at EU level, we know that for children under three, it's only around 27% uh, of children at risk that participate compared to around 39% uh, not at risk. Uh, and this, this, this kind of difference holds even when we account uh, for uh, other characteristics of children involved and the families that they live in. So this could be, for example, the gender of the child or the household composition, which we did in a regression analysis. In fact, we found that uh, some char family characteristics that are often associated with poverty and social exclusion risks further exacerbate uh, the probability of not participating in childcare. So for example, low parental education it reduces the probability of uh, participating in childcare for children below three by about seven percentage points uh, based on our analysis. Again, I think this is about what we, what we have time for uh, to set up the discussion. Uh, so our, you can read uh, more in the full report online. Uh, and I would like to hand back to Florence with this. Thank you very much. Um, so let's look at the results of our Slido poll before I turn to our panelists. Um, housing affordability is quite clearly the most uh, perceived as the most pressing challenge for young people's living conditions. Um, and I'm sure we'll uh, hear about 
the outcome of the Slido poll from our panelists. So I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Alina Grishkova, who's head of the Gender and Sociology Department uh, at the Institute of Sociology in the Czech Academy of Sciences. Next to her is Cecilia Garcia Peñalosa, who's professor of economics at the University of Aix Marseille in France. And next to her is Eva Marx, who is a director of the Center for Social Policy, Hermann de Lake at the University of Antwerp. Welcome to all three of you. Um, Cecilia, I'll turn to you first because um, the income inequality, it seems, did not particularly increase during the pandemic, but uh, COVID has exposed many other challenges and inequalities in terms of uh, education, household wealth, um, and access to services for young people. So during your research on inequalities, what kind of trends did you see emerging among young people during the post-pandemic recovery period for, for what it lasted, but mostly related to the post-pandemic? Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to be here. So in fact, you're absolutely right that this, when we look at the data, we see this slight ham shape uh, relationship between time and, and inequality. So it increased a little bit and, and went down quite uh, rapidly, largely because of government policies, because of government in their intervention to support individuals' incomes. So I think we, we need to look both at the past and at the future when thinking about inequality, at the past to see what are the experiences we have seen and at the future to see what are the seeds that the pandemic has planted there. In terms of the past, there's some interesting work that has looked at the pandemics of the past 20 years. We, they haven't been as severe, but we have had SARS, we have had N1H1, so there have been a number of shocks. And what the data seems to be showing there is that changes in inequality took time. So, you know, estimates indicate that in year one, after one of these pandemics, uh, the increase in equality was half a percentage point. By year two, it was one percentage point, but five years after the pandemic, it had gone up to four percentage points. That's about 12 percent of the average Gini in the sample. So this is a relatively large increase in net income inequality, so that's taking into account already government uh, transfers, and this indicates that we should be cautious about um, our conclusions of what has happened so far. The second aspect is that there have been many changes that could be uh, causes for future inequality. There's been a discussion already on the stage on education. And of course, this is an enormous uh, a source of potential inequality. Um, I want to say that we know very little about the extent to which uh, changes have been, uh, so changes in educational outcomes have been dependent on uh, the background of the household, because in most cases, school closures have been for all schools. But there are some interesting examples that appear. I think Japan will teach us a lot, because uh, Japan kept preschools open, but closed schools. And so we're going to have children, or we have children, that with a few days of difference in, in birth date will have been in school throughout the whole period or in preschool throughout the whole period or not. It's too early to see what are the differences in terms of educational outcomes, but there's evidence that there has been a change in uh, overweight outcomes. So the children that didn't go to school uh, increased their weight much more than those who went to preschool, and that increase happened exclusively in low-income households. Mm, so evidence of an effect of schooling there, which is important. The second aspect is the accumulation of human capital once uh, we leave a formal education. And again, some indications of the direction of where this is going have been given on the stage already. Um, hiring of young people has fallen, and so labor market experience will be different. There have been some unintended consequences of policy. 
the no layoff policies uh, that most, go or most EU governments impose have led to not firing individuals from permanent contracts, but not renewing temporary contracts. And of course, those contracts were overwhelmingly those of young people, so a difference in labor market experience. And then I want to go back to a point made in the early session in, in the room about mentoring. Uh, a lot of uh, people have entered the labor market online. And clearly, the amount of learning, the amount of human capital, the amount of social capital and networking you create is not the same, and these people will be affected. And the last point I want to make has to do with wealth inequality. Uh, we can come back to this, but there has been it's, there has been an increase in wealth accumulation during the pandemic. This wealth accumulation does not seem to be evenly distributed. It has concentrated a lot at the top. And I want to point out that this potential wealth inequality, we don't have precise measure yet, is occurring at a time in which the housing market is exhibiting trends completely different from what we observed uh, in the past. The share of uh, individuals between 25 and 34 that are owner occupiers has fallen dramatically over the past 30 years. The UK is particularly striking. It has gone down from 68% to around 35%, but similar trends are observed in other countries. And here we have the potential for a very important source of inequality. Thank you very much. Um, Eva, before the pandemic, uh, young people were already hit by uh, significantly higher poverty rates and, and uh, decreasing, decreasing home ownership. But during the pandemic, there have been a lot of support measures put in place uh, to support uh, their, the, the impact, uh, to soften the blow, really, of uh, the, um, the pandemic and help their... Uh, help their disposable income, support their disposable income. But do you think those measures are now uh, sufficient to uh, prevent the negative outcomes or maybe even revert the negative outcomes uh, during the recovery phase? And, and that would be, of course, despite the economic crisis that we're facing at the same time. Um, thank you also for the invitation. And I also want to... Um, commend the SD team uh, on their new report, and that's not just out of politeness, I think it's really an invaluable resource for, fact, for informed thinking about social policy in Europe. And so don't uh, underestimate how important that is that you make those uh, reports. I feel the urge to, to inject a bit of a, um, uh, some optimism into the debate, uh, as it were, because I've heard a lot of, of not uh, gloomy predictions. Uh, um, and I've been in the business of, of social policy research for 30 years. And I've heard a lot of, I've seen a lot of gloomy predictions come and go. Uh, they, w they were saying decades ago that inequality would increase and that poverty would increase and that precarity would increase and that there would be no good jobs left and so on. And none of, none of it has happened. It has happened in some places, so during some times, um, but it's not a structural trend. The structural trend is, by and large, a positive one. Uh, there are better jobs, and there's uh, less, um, well, there's not less inequality, but, but, but things are, 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 broadly speaking, um, uh, improving. And the same applies, I think, to the, the COVID-19 crisis. I remember very vividly at the start of the COVID-19 crisis that we would see a tsunami of, that was what the, the word that people were using, of inequality and poverty and so on. And none of that has happened. And as you show in the report, the stabilization worked remarkably well. I mean, we should not underestimate what a huge impact all those uh, measures had. And, and that's what you demonstrate very, very well in the report, um, um, I, I think. And also, we should also not forget that the whole crisis prompted the EU to take really a couple of quantum leaps. A next generation EU, that was a quantum leap in, in, in the EU. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, the minimum wage directive was approved. 
man, but that who, who would be would have believed that that would happen. Um, and there's more, and there's more, and the sure mechanism, there's more in, in the pipeline. So, on top of that, I think for young people, I, th I think the structural outlook, perhaps in the short term, and we don't know whether, we'll be whether we will see a recession or not, and, and, and uh, perhaps I agree there with Pierre Cahuc, but on the, the, the longer term, of course, we know that far more older people are leaving the labor market than young people, in people are entering. So their bargaining position is structurally improving. Uh, they are, they are in, a strong, in a strong position, in a stronger position than, than ever, I think, uh, especially young graduates entering the labor market. And perhaps a, a final point I want to, 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 to uh, highlight is another trend structural trend I think is that we see that we're seeing the end of what I would call dogmatic neoliberal thinking about labor markets the idea that minimum wages are bad and all kinds of labor market regulation is is bad and the minimum wage directive is a perfect example of that and the OECD has come to that view and the IMF has come to that view and there is a ton of research that smart regulation not any regulation that smart regulation it uh, can be a good thing and that can, that can, uh, that can co protect people because uh, when they're thinking about housing and housing affordability, the labor market position of young people is key and they need to be well protected. They need to have well, uh, good jobs and, and jobs that pay enough. And so we see, we, we see the minimum wage directive and also what is happening at the country level. I mean, that's a major development and we need more steps. We need a European initiative on, on minimum uh, incomes that is the size if that has a uh, real impact. Um, but I think um, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, uh, broadly speaking, I'm pretty optimistic, really. Thank you. A reassuring thought. Thanks. So, Alena, um, we've, we've heard from the report, we've seen in the results of the report that uh, the gender pay gaps emerge quite early on in life. Uh, and, and in careers, um, on the basis of your research into gender pay disparities, gender pay gaps, what are the key factors that contribute to those pay gaps so early on in the careers? Thank you, and thank you very much also for inviting me here, and this is a really important topic and question, so thank you for that. And I will start with pessimism, but I will also raise some hopes because I think that's important, so thank you. Uh, well, um, it's true already the pandemic, before the pandemics in the decade about of the, uh, before the pandemics, the gender wage gap, the overall gender wage gap also for very young people in the labor market uh, increased quite significantly. And uh, when using the data where we can decompose the overall wage gap from the within job gender wage gap, which didn't really increase significantly, we see that it's mostly due to gender segregation. There's increasing gender segregation in this uh, youngest uh, age group. And recent research shows that um, actually, definitely, it's not the individual characteristics because young women, especially young women, are much more educated than young men already today. And sociological research points to the trend that happens in the developed countries and it's in the la last couple of decades. And that is uh, the increasing difference between the average wage in at the workplace level. So workplaces are basically uh, moving more apart uh, and it's throughout all developed countries. And um, there's this gender effect that women are, tend to be employed more in the lower, uh, uh, in the workplaces with lower wages and men tend to be employed in the workplaces with higher average wages and with better working conditions overall. However, uh, we also see very recently when using very uh, detailed data where we can, we can uh, really see even the wage gap for the same work that, um, and it's quite surprising, especially for some developed countries where we saw, where we were hoping that there is no more uh, gender wage gap within job, especially Nordic countries and so on. 
uh, and we I have to say we use the age category 30 to 55 for this analysis so there are some uh, it's some there are some specific characteristics to this age group and we see that about half of the wage group is caused by the seg gender segregation women and men working in different positions in different occupations and different workplaces but about half of the gender wage gap is still caused by the within job gender wage gap and so I would like to again stress the role of gender stereotypes here, which uh, we heard already in the previous panel, which plays a role in this gender segregation um, trends, but also within job gender wage gap, and that is connected uh, to care, parenthood and care obligations and family policies, which was not mentioned here yet. And I think that women, when planning their career, young women, they already see what is the situation and what are their prospects in the labor market and what are their um, possible choices, also given the different national or country level family policies, tax policies, and also another trend is, of course, the gender segregation during the educational process. But also they see what they can expect when they decide to have a family. Uh, so very important role of stereotypes at all stages of their entrance to the labor market during really very early on already in the nurseries and kindergartens. We see that education still is not um, gender stereotypes free, I would say. And then during the hiring process and um, promotion to a higher position during the careers, that's very important. But I would like to also point another, uh, another uh, problem and that is connected to the availability of data and the trends in the labor market because we heard about what is happening, increase in precarity and uh, non-stable jobs, temporary jobs and atypical contracts. And these um, people who fall into these types of jobs, but also to unemployment, they are very often not included in those statistics of gender wage gap. And so in some countries we have seen uh, even that the overall gender wage gap decreased during the pandemics, which might be caused partly also by the fact that because women are more uh, represented among low-wage workers, they fall into unemployment or those jobs that are not included in those statistics, uh, self-employment, even false self-employment or gray, gray economy, or they are um, inactive and they are not included in these statistics. So we should strive for more uh, better data mapping and better use of different sources of data. And to raise some hope, I would say, uh, and that is a hope into, because I talked about the situation at the level of workplaces, and I have some hope uh, in terms of the EU directive on the uh, wage transparency. That is a very important uh, EU initiative, but also I have to stress the role of the EU directive on work-life balance. That is very important to be implemented uh, at the country level, because what is very important is the sharing of the care obligation within families. That is still a problem. Uh, and, within, and share of parental leave and also availability of the child care services to point just some of the aspects that play an important role in the decision making of women, but also in the decision making of the employers, because they uh, then based on these family policies that are also embedded in those gender stereotypes and about the fact that women are expected to care more um, then it has a significant impact on women's wages and working conditions and career prospects. Thank you. Um, let's have a uh, new Slido poll and we'll look at the results right away um, to, to f hear, to see how you all feel about this current situation. Um, so looking ahead, do you expect living conditions of young people to improve, worsen or remain stable? For the moment, the worsen is, I'm afraid, the pessimistic trend uh, is, uh, is very clear. Um, 
and I don't think we need to wait for very long, uh, even if there is maybe a slight difference of, re of a few percentage points going up and down, uh, the trend is very clear, or the opinion is very clear, despite, uh, despite Eva's more optimistic view. So um, we, I'm very conscious of time. We have 10 minutes left, and we must finish on time because there's a closing session, which is a plenary session, so people will need to be able to go from here to the, the uh, next door room. So just a few words, really, in, in this final round. Um, Cecilia, um, how do you see income inequalities developing, particularly in view of the green and digital transition? So a one-minute answer, and I know it's very difficult, but... So if we're focusing on the, 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 there are two aspects. One is uh, inequality across generations. And you know, I, this is something that I think will be very much affected by policy decisions and by inflation, but maybe not so much by the green transition, although there can be some conflict there. Do we support pensioners? Do we support the green transition in terms of how public fundings are used? And, and this is going to be important for this across-generational inequality. Then there's the issue of within-generational inequalities young people. Yes. And so here, uh, I think there are two issues because the two sectors that are growing are the green and IT sector on the one hand and the personal services sector. And in the former, we tend to have highly educated men. And in the personal services sector, we have low education uh, individuals and women. And wages are growing at very different rates in those two. And this, I think, is a source of potential inequality, and both because of the gender component, but also because of the family background. And here I'm, I'm going to, to qualify something that was said by Daniele Kecki, one of the panelists very in the previous rapidly, uh, sessions. Very, very rapidly. That, you know, it's not, I think this recession may be different. The level of skills required by the sector is very high. And I'm not as optimistic as he is about enrollment in education during the recession. Thank you. Eva, now we, we, we are facing, uh, particularly in the current circumstances, uh, labor shortages, but also rising prices um, and, and a twin transition, a difficult transition. So would you consider that the main challenges and opportunities uh, to improve young people's situation um, what do you think they are? Uh, you know, what, what can we get out of them? Main challenges, main opportunities? Well, I'm failing at, at uh, trying to inject uh, optimism into the debate, but I'm <laughs> going to keep trying. Keep trying. And, uh, yeah, keep well, trying. Well, no, I, I wanted to, to, to say something about, perhaps about that issue of housing affordability, which features very prominently. And of course, what is important for, for that is a, a strong, stable economy, and, and low inflation and low interest rates and, and all of that. We know that. But another thing is how that I think we need to think about how we can support people. And my feeling is that um, policies in many countries are still very much geared towards, towards supporting individuals and households. Uh, support for individual home ownership. And that means that people, wha when they buy a house, when they buy a flat, or they, when they, they, they're building that, they need to think for themselves, how am I going to isol isolate that? And how, uh, how am I going to heat? Uh, what is the, the, the most cost-efficient ecological way of heating my place? And they need to, uh, to do all, all of that themselves. And that's a very, very inefficient uh, process, of course. And I think uh, if we really want to uh, move forward, and that means f moving forward um, in terms of affording houses, which is social progress, but also we need, of course, ecological uh, progress if we want to combine and achieve those, both those things at the same time. We need to think more about how we can support communal uh, initiatives and commu communal um, solutions uh, to that. And of course, people will want their own privacy and their own lifestyles and so on. They, they don't want to live in communes, mm -hmm. but there are, there are solutions that, that combine those, the, 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 the economies of scale um, and at the same time um, 
uh, so that people can lead their own uh, lives. I think that's a very important challenge when it comes to, to housing affordability in particular. Thank you. And that actually answers one of the questions we had received online, which was, how do you see access to housing for young people developing in midterm? And that could be one of the solutions. Of course, there could be loads of other proposals, uh, and, and uh, uh, we could probably discuss them for a while, but that could be one uh, of the answers to that particular question. Um, Alena, Let's keep looking forward. Let's keep looking ahead of us. Uh, do you expect major changes or at least some changes in the various factors that contribute to the gender pay gap um, at the beginning of careers? I mean, are, are things evolving? Well, if you want my expectation, I would have to be rather p pessimistic, <laughs> which I don't want to be. And I have, uh, yes. It's, it's uh, developing and uh, it's very much connected to the trend of increasing uncertainty, I would have to, s uh, I have to say, and that's been already mentioned and discussed here. And um, uh, uncertainty into um, how my career will develop and what will be expected. And uh, I have to say that the policies in this uh, aspect don't help really women uh, and uh, again is the family policy tax policy and but also the educational system that is still very much based on gender stereotypes so there is some hope into policies that would be really analyzed from their gender impact and we unfortunately have seen it in the pandemics that very often those uh, very fast made uh, decisions and policies, uh, anti-pandemic policies, they were not analyzed uh, from this point of view and uh, we, we can see the consequences for women. So, so my hope is to really um, um, conduct the gender impact uh, analysis of, of uh, all policies that we introduce and to try to um, make policies or change policies so that they, do, they are not enshrined in the gender stereotypes, that they are not based on the stereotypical values about uh, women carers and male uh, technicians and uh, uh, with their career prospects and, and, and so on and so on. So. We will have to, we have a lot of work ahead, I would say. I can imagine. Mm. Um, my, my last question is, is a question we've received uh, online. Unless we have a pressing question from the room, do we? No, we don't. Well, let me raise that question that we have received online then. Um, there are or are there regional differences in the situation of young people? We know there are because we have seen from the outcome of the report. And my question is going to be to uh, both you, Jakob and, and Carolina. Um, and sorry, whoops. Um, and how can we address those uh, differences, those regional differences? If you can maybe give us a couple of uh, guiding points in a couple of minutes. Well, I mean, it's a big question, uh, but uh, I will try to answer this. We did not analyze this so much in the ESDA review, but we have some, some other work on this, so I will reflect maybe on, on, on that other thing. So I think when you look, so if I limit the question to say income and wealth disparities across regions that we see, and we see them basically across all uh, irrespective of age to some, to some degree. And if I, if I focus on that, I think we know from our analysis that if, if you go at regional or sometimes even local slash municipality levels, uh, there are, the inequalities are quite high. And they are high across regions, but they are also very high still within regions. So across regions within a country, you tend to have quite some variability, but within regions, it often is even higher. So you see, you see quite a few disparities, and it's not just about regional level, it's even at, if you go into a more granular level, uh, say, if you think about Brussels, how, how the type of inequalities work around here across different, say, neighborhoods and so on. Uh, so I think, uh, <laughs> to answer simply, yes, there are regional differences, uh, and there are, they, they can be quite significant, often higher than across countries. And for the, strat for the policies to address them, I, I really don't think I have much time to develop this here in, in, in more detail. But I do think that 
it's usually a combination of policies, so it usually tends to be a package of policies that you have to adopt. It's not a single policy area that you focus on. It tends to be a package of policy areas. And it's policies that really need to be tailored to location and the type of thing, the type of, say, locality that you're talking about. Because different municipalities, regions, whatever, face quite different challenges. Mm -hmm. And you need to have some kind of tailoring of this policy, and, but also some kind of an overview of how it works across these regions. I, I think I can, with this space, I can only give such a general answer. Yeah, absolutely, and also, I suppose, coordination between the various uh, policies, because there's a lot of, uh, there's a very broad range of policies that need to be coordinated in order to achieve those goals. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are sharp on time, uh, so very happy that we have been able to take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I will let you move back to the main room for the final closing plenary session. I would like, first of all, to thank uh, all our speakers again and our interpreters, uh, as well as our tech team for this session. I also, I'm sure in everybody's name, would like to congratulate the SD team again on this report. The feedback has been unanimous, and if you have looked into it, I'm sure you will agree with that. So on those words, uh, thank you very much for joining us for this breakout session and enjoyed the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.